Good morning, everyone, and happy Wednesday. Uh, now, looking up, hopefully the weather back at your place um, in Canada is a little bit nicer than it is down here in Pennsylvania right now. It's kind of cloudy out, and I think we might be getting some rain. Um, but if with the days um, getting a lot nicer with summer uh, being present right now, we're approaching the summer solstice, of course, uh, longest day of the year. Um Hopefully, you might be able to get some fishing in if you really like to fish. Um, or at least going for a walk and looking in the rivers and the creeks in your area. Um, and with that, of course, there's fish living in those creeks and rivers. Uh, now, with the Medway Creek right by the museum, uh, the Museum of Ontario Archaeology, that is, um, there are about 43 species of fish that can be found in that creek. Um, now, if you're going for a walk, the things that you're probably going to be seeing along that creek are going to be the little minnows. And minnows is kind of just an overarching term for just any small freshwater fish. Um, now, you know, they all have their own special little species names if you take the time to go look them up and see which ones are which. Um, but if you see a small fish, it's a minnow. It might be a baby fish from a larger fish, one of the three that we're going to be talking about today. Um, but if you see a small fish, it's a minnow. <laughs> um, and those are the ones you're probably going to be seeing a whole lot more of. There are shiners and carp, and of course, um, the three fish we're going to be talking about, the largemouth bass, the northern pike, and the rainbow trout, they're all in the creek, but they're just not as common um, as those little minnows. Now, that being said, the first fish, as I said, we're going to talk about is the largemouth bass. So one of the most interesting things I saw about these fish, um, for all three of them, is they just the amount of food that they'll eat. They they are they're opportunistic feeders. That's the fancy word for it, which means they'll eat anything you put in front of them. You know, anything. Um, but first, we're going to talk a little bit about the size. So these fish are medium sized. Um, the what, of course, how you saw from the picture, their back and sides are a green to an olive color, and then their belly is yellow. Uh, and then they have that broken horizontal stripe along the side of their body, that black stripe, and it kind of just looks like little colored and zigzags all across it, like dot to dash line <laughs> that somebody just took a, a crayon to and they just colored along it. Um, and as far as the exact size go, typical size of these guys are about 25 to 55 centimeters, but the largest one ever caught in Ontario, at least one I could find, um, weighed about 4.7 kilograms. So that was a pretty large fish <laughs> that somebody reeled in um and i don't know exactly where that was um now as far as the environment they like to live in um they like warmer water as opposed to really cold water um and they also like it to be weedy now that's just it's like all the aquatic grasses and mosses and there's things growing in the water that are plants <laughs> um that way they can hide in them it produces a good amount of oxygen for the water um, and they also like slow moving bodies of water as opposed to really quick moving rapids or anything. So you won't find them around there. Um, and then they'll also live in ponds and lakes. So you can find them in there too. Um, now they also have, as I said, an incredibly varied diet. All three of these fish are opportunistic feeders, like I said. So as young fish, when they're really small, they'll eat a fish smaller than them pretty much. That goes for pretty much any fish. If they if there's something smaller living in the water that they can eat, they will take advantage of that and they'll eat that. Um, and then they'll also eat the little shrimp and also insects, whether they're aquatic insects or they're like flies and terrestrial insects, that's called. So ones that are on, on, on the ground, <laughs> not in the water. Um, now the adult fish, they will eat, again, anything. Um, they'll eat the smaller fish, of course. They'll eat snails, crayfish, frogs, snakes if they can get a hold of them, salamanders, bats even. So if bats come close to the water, they might be able to catch those because bats, of course, need to get a drink. So they will dive down and uh, scoop some water up. Um, and they'll even eat small water birds and mammals, which is baffling to me. But um, if they can get a hold of a mouse or a mole or a vole, or, you know, if it, there's a small water bird, they'll go for it. <laughs> uh, it's kind of amazing, those fish. Um, the next one is the northern pike. Now, these fish are kind of scary looking. They have actually, they actually have teeth in their mouth. Um, they're carnivorous, of course, like most of these fish. Um, so that means they eat meat. <laughs> so that can range from bugs to, again, waterfowl and small mammals, like these largemouth bass. Um, the look of these guys, as you saw, they have, they usually have an olive green color to them, and then they have the yellow and the white belly. Again, 
Um, they have the light spots all over their bodies. They kind of look like leopard spots a little bit, and that's on the adult fish. They develop those when they turn into adult fish. They don't have them when they're little. Um, their fins are sometimes a reddish color. Um, and then they'll, and I think I'm pronouncing this right, uh, they resemble a muscalunge, which is a really similar looking fish. And they're in the same family. They're the same very close similar species of fish, um, but just not quite. Um, and the muscalunge actually grow a lot bigger. And here's a pic of that. Um, so despite northern pike looking pretty big, they don't quite reach the size that those fish can get. Um, now that being said, they can hit lengths of about 137 centimeters and weigh 28.4 kilograms. So they're not light fish by any means. They're not small. They're fairly large. Um, but there is a larger version that looks almost exactly the same. Um, now again, freshwater fish, they live in the Medway Creek. Um, and then they inhabit vegetated lakes as well. Quiet pools. So smaller bodies of water um and of course creeks and small to large rivers so pretty wide-ranging habitat again um as far as food pretty similar to the largemouth bass they'll eat invertebrates so that's any animal without a spine um they'll eat other fish they'll eat amphibians like frogs um small mammals again and waterfowl and our last fish is this colorful one So this is a rainbow trout. Uh, they, of course, get their name from the variety of colors on their skin. They're not just a brown color. They have that really neat pink stripe on them, usually. Um, and then the colors can also vary from whether it's a male fish or a female fish, as well as their habitat, if it's, you know, cooler water or warmer water, if it's a uh, bit polluted, um, different things like that, as well as how old the fish are, so maturity. Um, so the colors include, uh, of course, brown to olive, and then they can get a darkish blue with a pinkish stripe running the length of their bodies. Um, so they can get rather pretty looking um, for fish, as opposed to the other two, which are kind of just green and white. <laughs> That's just about their only colors. Um, they also have all of those black spots on their backs, fins, and tail, as well as a silvery belly that fades to white, so kind of shimmery. Um, now, these can typically reach lengths of 40 centimeters and weigh about 1 to 3 kilograms. Um, but again, the largest ever caught was in Canada, <laughs> and it weighed 22 kilograms. So again, pretty hefty fish. Um, and that's, you know, if you leave a fish go, that it's going to be able to not really have any predators. It's going to have a large food supply. They'll keep living and getting larger and larger and larger. So that's how we ended up with a 22 kilogram uh, rainbow trout, which again, baffling, but <laughs> that's the size that came up. So I was surprised. Um, uh, with their habitat, like the others, they prefer cool freshwater streams with gravel bottoms, so those really small little rocks. Um, and they like natural covers, so that just means that there's trees overhanging the water, um, and there's shrubs on the side, and, you know, just something that has some cover. If there's, like, a down tree over top, too, that's something that they do like. Boulders also, as well. Um, and then, again, as far as a food source, it's not as crazy as the previous two um since they are smaller fish they won't go after waterfowl and bats and mammals and things like that um they tend to like um again the aquatic or terrestrial insects so either water bugs or bugs that we see flying around in the air um they also will go for fish eggs if they can find fish eggs they'll eat our poor little minnow friends that i mentioned at the beginning the little tiny freshwater fishies um, they'll also eat crustaceans, so those are your crayfish, and they'll also eat worms, so if they can get a hold of those if they come out of the ground um, and end up in the water. And that's what you can use to catch them, too. You know how you can use that. All right, all that being said, uh, we are going to head inside. We're going to do a quick little craft, um, super easy. <laughs> um, just have a printer and a piece of paper and your coloring utensils, whatever you want to use, crayons, um, colored pencils whatever you want to use. <laughs> so I will see you inside. All right, so for today's craft, I thought it would be fun to make a super simple little bookmark based off of the fish that we talked about today. So the rainbow trout, the largemouth bass, and the northern pike. And you can use him as a little hinge. Maybe he can be a chip bag holder so you can clip your bag shut but I figured a bookmark would be really good because he can hold our pages for whatever book we're reading in this case I have a little field guide or if you have any sort of book you're reading he'll be able to bite down on it and make sure that your page doesn't get lost 
So to make this guy, when I first made mine, I used construction paper. Now for what I have for you guys is just a super easy little template here. You can see I already cut that out. Um, but you're, you'll be able to find just the outline of all of these fish on archaeologymuseum.ca. Um, exactly where all of the other different templates are for these videos. So if you scroll down from the home page, click on the uh, kids activities link, I believe it is, kids crafts and activities here. Um, and then there's going to be a little link to go to a specific part of the website where it's all resources of the Medway Valley um, templates and different things like that, craft things, instructions, all that, um, so that you'll be able to just print that out and work from that instead of having to like worry about drawing like an exact perfect little fish. Um, and you can totally do that if you want to make your own. Like I'm not going to stop you guys. Um, definitely draw one out on your own. It'll be good practice. Um, or if you have a fish that you've seen already and it's not any of these three, maybe you go fishing and you catch them, um, feel free to draw that fish. Maybe it has a really fun story behind it and, um, yeah, so do that too. Um, and um, then, it's, since it's just the outline, there's none of these little like uh, fish, uh, the tail ribs or the dots or lines or colors or anything like that. It's just the outline. That's all up to you guys if you want to color them um, in exactly how they are. Um, again, if you want to draw your own fish, feel free to do that. They're pretty easy. You just have to make sure you cut down the middle. And they kind of have to have that like middle portion there where their mouth and their tail kind of line up. Um, but yeah, so I already colored mine in, and I actually already cut out the uh, fish I'm going to be using. So I'm going to do the largemouth bass for mine. I did the rainbow trout when I did it before, so I'll just push that off to the side. So you'll need a colored in fish, and it's easier to do it on the whole paper itself to color it in instead of like having to work around the tiny little fish. If you do it that way, then yeah, it's fine. It, it'll still work. It's just a little easier on the pin paper itself. Um, so one of those little fish, you're going to need a clothespin of some sort. Um, it doesn't have to be a clothespin. It can be uh, goodness. It could be a bag clip. If you have a bag clips on hand, um, you can rig anything up. If you don't have anything like that, I mean, and you still want a bookmark, you can just get a piece of cardboard and glue the fish on and there's a bookmark. Um, so you don't have to um, make sure it's like exactly like going to be a hinged little clothespin, but that'll make it look like the fish is eating. <laughs> so you'll need a clothespin. Of course, to color, you're going to need your colored pencils. You won't have to watch me do that today. You're going to need a pair of scissors as well to cut your fish out as well as to cut them in half. And then you're also going to need your hot glue gun. Probably any super duper sticky glue will work. Um, I don't really have anything that great. Um, and just because of this metal part, it would have to be pretty sturdy and be able to like hold on to the metal. Um, so that's why I'm using um, a hot glue gun. If you have something that works really well, feel free to use that. If you have hot glue, use that too. I just don't think the uh, typical white um, craft glue is going to do the trick for this. And I didn't really test it. I'm just thinking it probably won't. Usually that's good for like paper on paper and stuff like that. All right. So this is really easy. Once you have your fish all colored in and cut out, all you have to do, and I don't know, the fish, luckily, he's not alive to actually have to worry about feeling this. You just cut right down the middle. And I put a dotted line on all of them so you can see exactly where to cut it. So that is what our fish looks like now. Boop, just like that. And all we have to do, and this is such an easy craft, <laughs> is we are going to turn it the right way. And on the top half of here, so you can see how they're kind of separated when you pull them together. On the top part, we're going to put our top part of our fish, and on the bottom part, we're going to put the bottom part of our fish. So let's see if I can do this in one try. And just make sure you put a good amount on top of the metal, because since it's a metal piece, it will cool off a bit quicker. All right. And just be careful. Again, if you need help, feel free to ask someone you're with. I'm sure they'd be happy to help you out, especially just with a little hot glue. Because it is not fun to get burned by something like that. I don't recommend it. All right. And you don't need a ton. You don't want it like leaking down into like the mouthpiece because that'll make the inside sticky and so you'll have some issues um, with that. 
if you just let that go. And it doesn't take long to dry. Just push it down a little bit. He'll have a little bit of a bump in the middle of him from the little um, spring hinge part on there, but that's okay. And then once that's cooled down enough, I'm going to separate it and put it on the bottom here. And the trick with this is you're going to want it to be lined up as close as you possibly can. So I always think the easiest way to do that is to look at the tail. So we push the tail together. Ouch. See, that's why we want to be careful like that. It's a bad thing you get all those little stringies from the hot glue too. Just like that. And hot glue, once it cools, you can kind of peel it off. So if it gets on your paper, it's really not a big deal. Because it'll cool down and you can just kind of peel it off. Alright. Whoopsies. Fish going for a run. Now. It looks like it could have glued the body up a little bit more on top of that spring, but that's okay. Um, but again, these guys are lined up, so... He looks like a very hungry um, largemouth bass there. And so, again, you can grab your book. He can hold on to your book. If you have a bag of chips or other snacks, or if you have goldfish, there you go. Perfectly themed snack for today. Um, feel free to clip them on that and hold the, a bag or a box closed. Anything like that. He's just your little fishy pal. And he will make sure you don't lose your page. All right. Hope you have fun giving that a try. All right, everyone, that'll pretty much do it for today. Uh, just a reminder again, tomorrow at 1 p.m. on Facebook Live, uh, you'll be able to find another hashtag MOA Live Talk with Heather. And then Friday at 10 a.m. is a Mad Libs episode with Katie on Facebook Live. Um, and also, just a quick reminder, if any of you are still interested in getting a um, camp kit, our first week one's theme is Amazing Archaeology, and the deadline to order is on June 29th. Um, so that's in a couple of days. That's exactly next week, actually. Um, so if you're interested, have a look at it. We have a whole bunch for the rest of the summer, too, if you need to keep um, your kiddos busy, um, or if you're a kiddo and you want to keep yourself busy. <laughs> it, it should be a lot of fun. We have a lot of really great plans for them. Um, so... We look forward to seeing you possibly for that, and I will look forward to seeing you at another episode of Resources of the Medway Valley, which I think I have as pollinators, because National Pollinators Week is coming up. Um, so my episode will be at the very end of that. So if you haven't learned a whole lot about pollinators uh, during that last week in June, then you'll learn a lot during my video. Um, I'll see you next week. So long.